Wiley, who um, I think I had the pleasure of partnering with maybe back in 2009. Um, we'd known each other a little bit, but she helped put together a PowerPoint, a free webinar. It was the first time I ever, you know, sort of hosted a webinar for um, folks in the food movement, because I do sustainable agriculture and food systems, to understand what structural racism means within the food system. And uh, as far as I know, this had been the first webinar of that type that was just available to the public, and we had about 75 people uh, join in on that call. And since then, we've done a number of things together. Maya is a civil rights attorney, and she's a nonprofit leader. She's the founder and president of the Center for Social Inclusion. And she has a long history of activism um, around issues of of uh, racial equity and opportunity, and, and I'm going to have to read this to make sure that I capture some of this. Um, she brings some experience in philanthropy. She was uh, an advisor on race and poverty to the director of U.S. programs at the Open Society Institute, now OSF, and she helped to develop and implement their South Africa Criminal Justice Initiative. Prior to that, Maya worked in the National Law Department at the ACLU and with the Poverty and Justice Program of the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. She's worked uh, for the Civil Division of the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the Southern District of New York, and she's helped to lead many nonprofits as a board member, um, including Human Rights Watch, Council on Foreign Relations, and the Institute on Race and Poverty at the uh, University of Minnesota. She's also the author of many articles, um, including a chapter in a book that, that, that I hope to pick up called um, Growing Smarter, Achieving Livable Communities, Environmental Justice and Regional Equity, where she wrote about um, race equity and land use planning. And some of you may have seen her last Sunday on um, the Melissa Harris Perry Show where she talked about transportation equity and sort of transportation creating first and second class citizens. So um, I want to just say that you all received index cards when you registered, when you signed it, and please use them to write down any questions that come up while Maya is um, presenting. And we will have Starita and I think Bernadette is that for a couple people collecting the cards so that um, we can do Q&A like that at the end. And of course, this is, I think you all know, this is a non-solicitation space, but I do want to say we really value having not only people sort of who are uh, philanthropic professionals, but folks who are, are part of the nonprofit sector, what we call allies. And we want to continue doing that in future programs so that we can have a healthy exchange and relationship building and dialogue. Um, and with that, I'll turn over to you, Maya. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Kohlu. Uh, you know, I thought Kohlu was going to say the most important thing about our relationship, which is that both our daughters are named Naja. And that was the most important thing. Um, so I'm very humbled to be here. Uh, the truth is, many of you could get up and probably give the presentation I'm about to give. Um, I want to thank both Anthony Simmons, Ingrid Benedict, and Colu for having me. And, you know, it, it is a homecoming. I, there's so many friends and allies that I've had over the years, so it's so good to see you all. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, and a lot of what I'm going to share, as I said, you all already know, so this is me lowering your expectations now. Um, so, um, but at the same time, I think it's important to put what we know already into a larger perspective, a larger context, because without that, we can't really do what Cole talked about, um, New York Blacks and Philanthropy working, so, and all of you, all, even in your organizations, institutions, working so hard to do, which is really produce a strong, prosperous black community. Um, and we are not, none of us able to do that by ourselves. The problems are too large, they're too structural, and our opposition is too strong. That's the bad news. I'll get to good news towards the end, or maybe not. All right, so let me just tell you a little bit about the Center for Social Inclusion, because I think it's important for you to know who we are in order to understand the perspective I'm going to share with you today. So we fundamentally are a policy strategy organization. 
right? Our focus is the policies that are going to produce more opportunity for communities of color. Um, we call that structural racial inclusion. Structural because it really goes much deeper than whether people intend for people to be hurt from <coughs> people of color or not. Because that's the reality of how we've structured society. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But for us, the core, some of the core components to how we are going to rebuild our structural arrangements to produce more opportunity for people of color, black communities in particular, is policy ideas, the ideas that actually drive a restructuring. I'll talk a little bit more about why policy is so central, but it also requires leadership, and that leadership has to happen in communities of color, in black community. It can't happen only at an elite <coughs> level and completely, det completely detached from the very people whose lives have to be engaged, are, are both impacted and have to be engaged in making that change. So we do a lot of work with leaders of color in community to figure out what some of those structural policy ideas are. Uh, as I said, no one does anything alone and you don't come up with big strategies by yourself. Um, and the third, of course, is talking about race. <coughs> we actually are not going to be effective at driving a lot of what we need to drive in this country if we are not more able to talk about race effectively. Um, I'm not going, this is not a race communications seminar. I could do that one, but I would need a lot more time than I'm going to get here. But suffice it to say that we are in a context that you all know, which is we're told we can't talk about race. We're told it's racist to talk about race. Mm -hmm. At the same time that we see a national conversation that usually claims that we're the root of all problems mm -hmm. in society at the same time that we are the most deeply impacted. So we are not going to win if we're not engaging on that. So we work on all three levels, but here fundamentally when I say structural racial inclusion, you know, this is all I'm talking about. We're really only talking about how deeply connected how we organize our housing opportunities are to whether or not we have ways to get to work or to schools, whether our physical environments are safe, whether our kids have parks to play in, whether we have grocery stores to buy healthy food in, whether that food's affordable if it is mm -hmm. healthy, whether we have access to health care. All of these things are all we mean by structural. They're deeply, deeply intertwined and, and interrelated, and they impact our lives in very, very basic ways, even when we don't see them as structural. I mean, structure is not something most Americans are very conscious of, even while we're making decisions around structure every day. And the most obvious example that I usually use is, how do you decide where you live? What are some of the first questions that come to your mind if you have the ability to choose where you can live? Schools. schools. One of the first, particularly anyone who is of childbearing age or who um, <coughs> will want to have children or has a family, the first question is not how many bedrooms can I get, does the roof leak or does the basement flood. The first question is what are the schools like? That's because we recognize, even if we're not always conscious of it, that where we live is going to drive the quality of the schools. And if we have the ability to choose, we will choose where to live based on how good the schools are and that our kids will access. Because we also know structurally that the better their education, the better their opportunities will be. So the more opportunity we create for them, the more opportunity they will have in the future, right? Is this race neutral? No. There's nothing about this structural arrangement as race neutral. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but so our goal is to produce this, structural racial inclusion, um, and part of that means recognizing that policies matter a lot. And again, this is, I'm not going to be sharing any history that you don't know, but I'm, this is now a policy history because we can't understand why this set of structural arrangements is not race neutral, or even how it got produced, unless we understand this. How do we create a middle class in this country? Middle class in this country is brand new. Is brand new. We did not create it till the second half of the 20th century. Prior to the Great Depression, we had a very, very few, very, very wealthy people, usually called robber barons, and we had everybody else. Now there were differences between that everybody else, as we know as black people, but nonetheless, basically, you worked 
you worked hard, you had trouble paying the bills at the end of the month, and that was basically everybody else. And there was no safety net, there was no social security, there was no unemployment benefits, none of that. So Great Depression hits, we create these policies, the first cornerstone of building a middle class for the first time in our history is the Social Security Act of 1935. Because for the first time, there was a government program that created a retirement system so that when you got too old or when you just chose not to work any longer, there was actually a way for you to continue to pay your bills. And you weren't dependent on your family, necessarily, right? So that which actually freed up your family to have more to invest in more opportunities. Because they were now not necessarily always taking care of their elderly. There were more resources. Uh, unemployment insurance. Disability insurance. For the first time, if you were disabled through work, you actually got a government benefit before, you again, your family had to figure out a way to support you. And this is the age of the Industrial Revolution, so there were lots of industrial industry, uh, injuries, people losing limbs. This was the era before we had occupational safety regulations. So this was actually a critical builder of the middle class, and did it discriminate based on race? Yes. But how? This is one of the most important things to know about the Social Security Act of 1935 is it didn't say black people are not eligible. Because it didn't have to. Because structurally, we were overrepresented in agricultural jobs and domestic work. So all it had to say was, you are not eligible for these benefits if you are a domestic worker or if you are an agricultural worker. You are simply not eligible. That was 60% of the national black population and 75% of blacks in the South. Now, it was intentional. I mean, it was intended to discriminate. The important thing here is to discriminate, even intentionally, did not require speaking to race explicitly because of how we had structured the labor market. Okay? Uh, the other thing that's important here, because I think we get confused about when is something about race and when is it not about race. And we, you know, typically people think, well, unless it was intended to harm people of color, it's not really about race. If white people get harmed, it's not really about race. And white people got harmed in this deal because there were white people who were agricultural workers and there were white people who were domestics. So even in 1935, this was going to hurt some people who were white. And it was intended to discriminate. So I think we get a little bit confused if we only look for racialized impacts in black community or communities of color, because the reality is we've never only hurt people of color. We've never only hurt blacks in all the ways we've discriminated. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't know you all so excited about that. Uh, I mean, the second thing is when you think of middle class status, you know, the first thing that most Americans think of is their pathway to the middle class is what? Home ownership, right? It's the, it is even psychologically, it is deeply ingrained in us as a culture, I mean, an American culture across race that home ownership, home ownership is, is the pathway. And you know what? <coughs> it has been for black people. But historically, what we did when we created the Federal Housing Administration is we discriminated against black homeownership. Because again, New Deal era agency that lives on today in the form of HUD, um, and for the first time created federal mortgage guarantees to incentivize banks to give home loans to people to become homeowners. And when you couple this with the Veterans Administration, the GI Bill, with all of these other programs that would start to come online connected to World War II, economic expansion, returning veterans, what we literally did was create a middle class up, create, by creating and vastly increasing the number of homeowners. At the same time, that, that happened in a way that created white suburbs for the first time in the country. I mean, we literally constructed whole new white communities. And one of the things that the FHA did was say, 
that they downgraded the credit worthiness of communities that were racially integrated. And they actually put them in the same credit rating category as pig farms and public nuisances. So what that meant is they literally drove the incentives for home ownership in a way that even broke up integrated communities. They also required that in the underwriting, these new homeowners that were moving to the suburbs, returning vets, buying these new track homes, include racially restrictive covenants in the mortgage. So that they were not permitted under their mortgage terms to sell to someone who was not white. I could go on, these are just some of the examples. Let me give you one local example for northern New Jersey, the impact of these policies meant that, and, and by the mid-1950s, 50% half of all home mortgages were federally backed. Just to give you a sense of how critical these policies were to driving home ownership, 50%, half. In New Jersey, northern New Jersey, of 66,000 federally backed home mortgages, how many do you think black people got? 200. 66,000 federally backed mortgages. 200. All right? You know, we can add on highway, because part of the way we drove creation of the white suburbs also included how we drove public dollars to highway construction, starting with the Defense Department. Outside of New Orleans, you know, we've talked about Hurricane Katrina a lot, a lot of the creation of the suburbs outside. Those highways existed before there were any homes there, out in Jefferson Parish. So a lot of highway construction dollars went to serving and creating more vehicle-driven, car-driven access for now white people to go to the suburbs and to come back in for work. And the other thing, and all of us, all of us, I mean, how many of you all have lived in a community that got crossed by a highway and split? Right? I mean, this is New York, so we had Robert Moses, Robert Red Hook, yeah. Brooklyn, hello. So one of the things that this destroyed was black entrepreneurship. Because these highways, not only were they bypassing communities of color, very few on-ramps in these communities that could buy something by highways. Not only were they bypassing them, they literally were ripping through black economic corridors. So they actually, not only did they not serve black community, they actually undermined some of the mom and pop economy that existed in black communities. So these policies, and they were all race neutral on their face, most of them, you know, with the ex exceptions like some of the FHA policies. A lot of them didn't call out race explicitly. And absolutely, I, I, at its best, didn't help people of color. And at its worst, actually did damage. So when we go back to looking at how we, at this, why we don't have this, we cannot separate our present condition from the policy choices we have. <laughs> My staff did that. <laughs> um, it's cute, I'm going to talk to them later. Mark, make it up. So now, fast forward to today, right? And we talk about a recession, but it's a black depression. And again, nothing we don't know. Um, you know, that all the talk in the past couple of weeks about ho how horrible it is that the unemployment rate is 8.2%. Anybody that would rejoice in the black community to have an 8.2% unemployment rate, it would actually be virtually historic. For, wow. I mean, there was one period where we got down to 7% uh, in 1999, I believe, 2000. We had a brief payday of only having 7% unemployment nationally. 8.2% um, would be pretty good for us. Um, you know, we're closer, this is, this is, we're now closer to 15% unemployment. And by the way, that masks, that masks a lot more unemployment than, that, and you all know this. I mean, our unemployment figures don't capture the real numbers because it doesn't capture people who are, have given up looking. Um, the other thing is, if we look by community, it doesn't actually capture the economic impacts on communities because when we look at, for instance, young men, 
you know, under 30 black men, we're going to see more like, you know, 25 to 50 percent mm -hmm. unemployment rate, depending on what communities we're looking at. So it's not even those national aggregate numbers don't even really describe the full the full picture. Um, but needless to say, nobody is in good shape right now. Nobody feels good, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Latino, whether you're Asian, Pacific Islander, Native American. Nobody's doing well, but we're doing the worst. And we're doing the worst by substantial margin. Um, but I wanted to go back. So the structural frame, when we use this structural frame, and I am going to use, because I've just been talking about it a lot lately, and because we just had a transportation reauthorization bill, I am going to use a, we could use a housing lens too, but I'm going to use a, a transit lens right now to demonstrate these structural inequities, but also suggest then what we can do about them. So we talked about the investment in highways. 80%, 80% of our public money historically goes to highways, 20% to public transit. We are six times more likely to be dependent on public transit. If this graph here shows the carless rate by race. Uh, for whites, carlessness is about 5%. Look at the black carlessness rate, it's like 17%. For Latinos, it's 13, a little over, uh, uh, yeah, a little over 15. Asian is 13. All right, so it's highly racialized even who has a car, and we drive our dollars to highways. Mm -hmm. The other thing to know is, is both how we get jobs and how we get to jobs. So number one, I, I have a friend, who's a total side note, who when she was doing her psychology PhD, did one on perceptions of black children in New York in terms of their career opportunities. Mm -hmm. And one of the, none of them thought when, when, you at, when she did this psychological survey and asked them what jobs they thought they had in their future, they all said bus drivers. Huh? Nobody said doctor, almost nobody said lawyer, they said bus drivers. And it made total sense because that's what they see. When they see people at work, they see us driving buses. They see us conducting subways, right? We actually get these jobs. Uh, and there's one, a Transportation e Equity Network did this very important study that found that with the Transportation for America uh, Coalition that, that estimated that if we, in just in the top 20 by size, largest 20 metropolitan areas, took half of transportation dollars and put it to public transit, so you can still have half going to highway, but half to public transit and create 1.3 million jobs. Mm -hmm. And those are jobs we get. But the other thing is, we can't get the jobs without the transit. We can't get to those other jobs. So 73% of the jobs in the 100 largest cities, metropolitan areas, are not accessible by public transit. 73%. And we're talking about low and middle skilled jobs. So we're not just talking about, you know, we're, we're not just privileged. We're talking about jobs that people can get if they have a high school degree or haven't finished high school. Um, but only 25% of those jobs, of those lower skilled middle jobs, that's manufacturing jobs, that's service sector jobs, only 25% of them are within 90 minutes <laughs> of a community by public transit. That's like saying, y'all can't come. So, you know, this is really critical. And the other thing is the expense. Obviously, because we are not subsidizing transit in any way, families are spending three times more on transportation than they are on health care or education, or food. Now some of that's also for people in cars because of gas prices. Um, and then the other thing is it's not just a federal issue. So, you know, we've got the worst, we just did the worst reauthorization bill. House, the House majority actually wanted to take all public spending out of transit and put it all in highways, 100%. The fight we were having six months ago was whether there would even be federal funding for transit. The impacts on our communities would be devastating. Yeah. Uh, how, much, how much of that do you think is associated with the strength of the transit workers union? Like, in, in terms of, in terms in of terms the professional of backlash? Well, no, I don't think that has anything to do with it. It's a gas lobby. Can you repeat the question? It, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. How, how much of this has to do with the strength of the, the the transportation union. I mean, I think the transportation union is very important, but the real story here is it's the gas lobby. It's the gas lobby. It's the gas lobby. They're very powerful and they want the money going to roads. So, I, I mean, that's an asset 
that we have is transit union. So, I mean, transit workers, so that's an important thing to recognize. But that, honestly, you know, in, in this particular political configuration, it's about the real power of the dollar. We don't have the power of the dollar. The gas lobby does. The other thing we have to note, though, is this is also state law. Uh, so there are 30 states in this country, either by legislation or by constitutional amendment, many of them in reaction to desegregation victories in the 50s, that said no gas tax revenue will go to public transit. So, again, it's not only, for, and you know what? To draw down these federal funds, that, that, that meager 20% that we can get, requires often a 20% state or local match. Mm -hmm. So if you can't use gas tax revenue, you can't, it's very difficult to find the sources to fund mm -hmm. transit. There are ways, I mean, some people are now passing bonds, you know, using bond strategies, but that's tough, right? You gotta have a lot of resources <coughs> for those fights. It'd be a lot easier if you actually had a legislative structure for having a revenue stream that you could draw down on for public transit. And I don't know if any of you saw the New York Times today, there was a really, unfortunately, very true depressing story about how state budgets are gonna be impacted over the next several years, even if the economy rebounds. So they're too deep in the hole. And one of the things that shows gas revenues on a, down, on a steep downward trajectory, because they're also not raising gas taxes in general, which is a big impact on state budgets. So, I'm just, policy matters. I mean, if we think we're solving any of this, any of, we can't, there is no service organization on this planet that can create a full and complete public transit system. We need government. We need revenue. We need investment in public infrastructure. It just doesn't happen any other way. I don't mean that there aren't things that we can do on the service side to connect or build to those opportunities. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying the real message here is we have to put our energy into policy. It has, it has decimated our communities for hundreds of years. And when we have made progress, it is because we made policy. Now we did it through organizing, we did, I mean, we did it through a lot of mechanisms, but we basically drove policy. And we cannot forget that now. Okay. Uh, transportation, again, like we said with housing, whether we have transportation impacts so many aspects of other opportunities. We don't have healthcare infrastructure in our communities by and large. We're lucky we have some health clinics. Mm -hmm. Hospitals are closing. We have very few doctors who will locate in, in low-income communities, rural communities of all races, but you know, we got 70% of our folk are in rural communities too, but it's also urban. 18% of Latinas, 10% of black women, 5% of white women don't access healthcare because of transit, transportation issues, okay? That's just, and that's just women. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit more sense of the gravity of this. We've been doing some healthcare access work in Texas. Um, our researcher created this map for Texas advocates 43 of the 65 counties, and remember, Texas is the place, right, that is where the governor is saying he's not going to expand Medicaid, which it, Texas has the highest uninsured rate in the country, Texas, Florida, right, the, the states with the largest communities of color outside of California. 43 of the 65 counties in Texas that have obesity rates above 28% have higher than average rates of carlessness. Um, it's actually, those numbers are even worse for the black, for predominantly black counties in Texas. Um, this is the other thing, white, so white Americans are five times more likely to live in census tracts with supermarkets. So again, when on transit, you're also, know, what, even your food choices are impacted. Um, you know, and I'm always struck by how many people I see on the subway carrying little plastic bags <coughs> come home from work because that's how they're getting their groceries. They're not getting their groceries particularly produce, it's usually produce, right? It's usually fruits and vegetables. They're picking it up in your work because they're not getting it in your home. Um, but 56% of residents and hazardous waste facilities, people call it, you know, this is, Manny Pastor did this really, um, he's a professor at the University of Southern California, economist, um, environmental justice um, advocate, 
deep supporter of community-based leadership. But he had a groundbreaking study that showed, you know, people used to argue, well, it's really a housing affordability issue because what happens is, you know, these people can only afford to rent or buy in communities that have these sites because they're cheaper, which assumes that people then are moving to places with high levels of hazardous waste or other environmental degradation. What his research showed is that was not true in LA. In LA County, the sites follow people of color. Their communities were communities of decreasing health because of increasing location of environmental insult. Um, so I'm just sharing all of this because there is a deep relationship between where we can afford to live, how we, have, how we drive transportation, what our schools look like, whether we access health care and healthy food, and whether we even have physically safe and healthy spaces is driven by these policies. Okay? And so this is the bigger picture now. If we pan out to the bigger picture then of what this look like, looks like, we did a um, recession impact analysis in 2009 and updated it in 2011. Um, so first I'm going to start with the congressional districts. This is all by congressional district percent people of color. At the darker colors, those darker browns, so starting with the brown, 35 to 50 percent people of color, uh, and the darkest is 57 to 99 percent people of color, all right? So keep that, obviously, you know, lower part of the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, South, Southwest, into the West, right? When we talk about where people of color are in this country, we actually are deeply concentrated in this lower belt of the country. This is what our recession impact analysis looks like. So the lightest colors are where the economic health is very weak or weak. And when we look at this, we looked at five categories of indicators with several sub-indicators. Health, job access, jobs, income, home ownership, lots of different indicators here. So a true structural analysis. So the worst, oh, the, the worst People of color concentrated, worst economic impacts. Not surprising in many ways. Um, and this is at a time when this is the place of increasing demographic, right? People of color are the fastest growing demographic in this country, as everyone knows. We're going to be, the, if, we are, if we think of ourselves collectively, if we think of ourselves collectively, black, Latino, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Native American, we are the new majority. Um, and I, policies, again, influence this. I mean, you all may have seen the recent Pew study that showed that Latinos are no longer the fastest growing immigrant population in this country, it's now Asian. And that's because of the crackdown policies that are largely focused on Latino immigration. But nonetheless, having said that, and I want to draw your attention in particular, youth of color is already there. They're already the new majority. 50% of all 18-year-olds and under are already people of color. Uh, and the majority of live births now are people of color. Okay? So we're already in this future when we talk about youth. Remember our unemployment numbers. The highest unemployment rates in the country are youth. Are youth. How do we fund Social Security? How do we fund it? Payroll taxes. So the generation, as we're talking about how we support those 65 and older in this country, the, the next up and coming generation that we have to rely on to pay into that system are either not in jobs or have the lowest wage jobs in the country. So think about that as a structural impact on the health of the nation as 65 year olds become both majority white but also a huge demographic of the country. All right. So this is hot off, it's not even hot off the presses, it's not even on the presses. Yesterday, I was in a conversation about the racial wealth gap in Washington, D.C. Closed door session, number of uh, experts, very multiracial group, but all focused on, you know, so Latino, Black, Asian Pacific Islander, Native American, having this conversation. Tom Shapiro, as many of you know, it wrote the, the one of the one of the I think we use the word seminal. It's obscene. Okay, one of the most important books on the black-white wealth divide in the 1980s. Mel Oliver, Tom Shapiro, 
Um, they continue to be some of the leading researchers on the racial wealth divide. This is his new research. This is longitudinal data starting in 1984, moving to 2009. And what this shows you is that essentially, so we talk a lot about the impact of the recession, which has gutted the black middle class. I mean, there's no question about it. But look at how much wealth, we basically have not been increasing in wealth since 1984. Our wealth has held basically constant. Whereas white wealth skyrocketed. And look at the reduction. I mean, so yeah, it's gone down. Nowhere near even 2003 levels. It's still above 2003 levels. It's just not at 2007 level. We've never gotten anywhere near those levels. And this is not a class story. What do I mean by that? We tend to think about class by do we own a home and how much income do we earn, right? This wealth divide is across class. And in fact, the wealth, wealthy blacks have a bigger race to wealth divide. But the wealth divide is constant. No, no matter how poor or wealthy. Um, this is also Tom's research. This, I mean, I was just blown away um, by this statistic. For every, so you know, we think about growing our incomes to grow our favorable position in society, right? We want to earn more money. If we can earn more money, it can buy us more opportunity. No. For each additional dollar of income a white person in America earns, they have five dollars of wealth accumulation. <laughs> for every dollar increase of income for blacks, 69 cents of wealth accumulation. And then you're going to ask me why Tom should be here, not me. But mm -hmm. here is, I think, one of the things that, um, that we should know. And by the way, this wealth divide, because we do a lot of our, the, a lot of those who oppose the kinds of investments in people that we want to see and support argue that we are a post-racial society. We had the civil rights era. We won. We got our black Muslim Christian president. What more do we want? <laughs> uh, so if, but if we are true, if civil rights legislation itself made us post-race and meant we didn't have to pay attention to it anymore, why do we have the biggest wealth divide we've had in 25 years? In other words, since winning all those victories. Um, the, the one thing that he really pinpoints, though, Tom Pence points, is home ownership accounts for 40% of the growth in wealth gap. Mm -hmm. Because, and this is fascinating, I don't think I put it up there, white Americans don't rely on home equity for their wealth. What? White Americans do not rely on home equity for their wealth. White Americans drive wealth through stocks. Most of their wealth is held in the form of stock in Wall Street. Black, for black folk, we hold it in home equity. So we're, even the way we start to drive, and there are a lot of reasons for that, and it's very complicated, and you know, I'm not even going to pretend to go through all of them, and many of you know some of them, but this is fascinating. So, College only accounts for 5% of the gap. And unemployment only accounts for 5 Again, because income is not really what's driving our wealth, as we see here. By, you know, even when we increase our income, we're not sizably increasing our wealth. Um, so again, structural. Structural. Not just about a job and income, but it's about whether or not we're getting the investments in home ownership, being able to buy our homes earlier, hold on to them longer. We buy five years later. We tend to only own our homes for 12 years compared to whites owning their homes for 26. We know that a lot of entrepreneurship is refinancing your home, a lot of sending your kids to college is refinancing your home. A lot of the ways in which we invest in our other opportunities do come from that equity we build. Right? And where are we able to, it's much harder for us to sock away dollars in, in, in savings that we can then put in the stock market. Okay, but very complicated and not just one structural reason for this, but um, I just wanted to point our attention to it because it was so dramatic. The other thing is black mobility. Again, if we are post-race, if civil rights laws got us where we needed to be and we don't have to pay attention to race anymore, 
Why is it, and this is research from Pat, Pat Sharkey at NYU's Wagner School, why is it that three out of four black families living in the poorest, most segregated neighborhoods today are the same ones that were living there in 1970? That's only true for 40% of whites. So white people living in high poverty neighborhoods are much more likely to move <coughs> on. Black people living in high poverty neighbors are much less likely. And by the way, this is true of the top three quintiles of earnings. So this isn't just a poverty issue, okay? This is black middle class doesn't get out of high poverty neighborhoods, not just black people who are poor. Um, so you all know the